I don't think everyone has joined us. I've read emails from folks saying that they can't make it, but uh, uh, see uh, maybe in the background muting people as they come in, um, uh, or you should be muted. So we'll go through some of the technology of how you mute and unmute yourself. Um, but hopefully most folks have introduced themselves in the chat box. It's about 9.02, so I think we can get started, um, but go ahead and keep introducing yourself. Um, I see Martha has uh, has said that she's learned that it's very hard for seniors to learn the new different and get them adjusted to a new routine. Yes, I have learned that I, I am a young senior uh, as well, and so adjusting, I, uh, I very much like my routine. So there was a short time when my, uh, my husband was home from uh, work and I was uh, working from home and adjusting to that change in routine was uh, didn't work that well for me. I like to eat and do things at a very certain time. So, <laughs> so seniors uh, might be have a hard time adjusting, but I think uh, a lot of us do. Um, I see Melody said the same, helping uh, seniors adjust to a new normal. Uh, Josh is uh, also with uh, Eden Healthcare. He loves his drive to work each day. Ah, yes, I love biking to work uh, and now I'm not doing it. So I, uh, I need to force myself to go outside for walks. I've also learned that outside will <laughs> helps to keep me sane. Um, okay, keep introducing yourselves and we'll uh, sort of go forward with this call. I'm so glad that you could join us today. A few uh, technical things. So um, you should see, depending on if you have it at full uh, screen or half screen, um, your, uh, you should have a bar across either the top or the bottom, which has little icons, which will help you um, uh, do certain tasks. So this little uh, button means to mute or unmute yourself. Um, some people can also do that from their computer or their phone, um, but this one is probably the simplest. You can also turn on or off your video. That's your choice. Uh, it's great to see your faces uh, because it feels like we're uh, having more of a conversation. Uh, so if you can turn the video on, that's great. Um, if you're still in your PJs, no pressure. Uh, the chat box. So there's a little icon that looks like a speech bubble that also has the chat box. So you can uh, click on that to keep it open. Um, so that you can see all the things that people are writing. I think you can chat either, yeah, you can chat with everyone or you can select the person that you chat with. I'm not sure if, web, I think WebEx, like Zoom, uh, gives us all of the chat. When we download the chat afterwards, we see everything that people wrote, even if you wrote it to someone else directly. So, uh, you know, you can comment on how cool we are and we'll see that, uh, that's fine by us. And if you want to speak to a topic, you can write your name in the chat box, um, or you can, uh, if you're on video, I can't see everyone at once, so sometimes people can raise their hand, but that would be difficult. Write your name in the chat box, ideally, or um, if it's, uh, we can try it. Last time we had people just unmute themselves and talk, and that seemed to work fine. Uh, so you can do that. There's a bit of a delay uh, in the chat feature, so be patient. Um, and then the red X is how you will leave the meeting. Um, so if you want to leave, click on that. If you don't want to leave, be careful. You don't have to uh, sign back in. Uh, so uh, this, we're all in this together. We're um, uh, at, we're far away from each other. But I know uh, from the questions that you've been asking uh, when you registered or uh, from phoning or emailing or just from conversations I've had with folks, uh, I know that we're uh, having similar challenges. So uh, this is a no judgment space. So we know we haven't uh, figured this all out. And so if someone has a question about how someone's doing something, uh, with each other. If we need to ask a health expert or uh, someone else for advice, we'll do that. And we'll talk at the end about um, 
about some upcoming uh, discussions that we have with folks who um, might have figured this out a bit more than us because that's their, <laughs> their specialty and their training, um, but don't feel like we have to have all the answers today. Uh, the agenda today, uh, so we've done introductions, key questions. So we're gonna go through the questions that people have asked uh, when they registered first. So uh, we got everyone's questions when you registered, they are on the agenda. Some of them uh, will fall under other questions because they're questions that aren't necessarily related to COVID-19, but are sort of uh, bigger uh, or sort of questions that uh, would affect you day to day anyway. Um, so we also have those uh, at the end and a chance for discussion. So if you have any other questions, comments, uh, we have time for that. Um, and then we'll also tell you a bit about what we're doing, some upcoming uh, webinars, and we have a survey for feedback so that we can get your feedback about this call and other things that we can do to support you at this time. Uh, so themes uh, that we'll be going through for the questions, uh, we sort of organize them by theme, so hopefully we can get a bit of a discussion happening on particular topics. So the themes uh, from the questions that we received in advance are protecting our staff and our tenants. So questions about cleaning and about uh, personal uh, protective equipment standards. Questions about finance, so about rent, uh, non-payment of rent, the rent freeze. Uh, questions about uh, making plans to return to norm normalcy. So the I think uh, when we first joined, Joanne was asking if we feel like this was a like the so the announcement yesterday sort of felt like suddenly everything is changing back um, and yet it's still going to be slow. So how are we planning to return to normal? Um, uh, so shifting gears a bit from locking down to slowly opening up in a safe way uh, and sector needs and advocacy. So things that um, people have raised as issues that uh, that we can advocate for together. So questions about protecting our staff and tenants. The first question uh, is around common areas. Uh, and this was a, a topic of discussion in our last call. And I think people are still, uh, it's still an ongoing challenge. This is, uh, I've had a few people actually call me with this question. So there's no perfect solution. Uh, common areas, what steps are organizations taking to reduce loitering um, or hanging out in public or shared spaces within the buildings. So Josh, uh, I think from Eden asked that question. Josh, I think I saw you introduce yourself. Do you, uh, would you be able to unmute yourself and to say there? Um, and then we can ask others to jump in and talk about what they've done. Yeah, for sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, yeah, so some of the steps that we've done, um, lots of signage, uh, some tape lines on the floor, uh, like mailboxes and things like that. Um, kind of the shared spaces have been locked up and uh, all the lobby furniture has been removed for the time being to also not give people a place to just kind of sit down. Uh, lots of conversations with people over the phone, trying to encourage them to not be congregating, but yeah, just seeing if anyone else has anything that uh, that they've found has helped them out. Has anyone else uh, had success on this? Or done other things that might not have been successful, but are <laughs> you're trying them anyway? Hi, it's Rob here from Brandon, West Men Lions Manor. Hi, Rob. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, some of the things, extra things we've done over and above that are to um, keep doors closed, not locked, but close, close the doors to the common area rooms, like our coffee lounge, library, um, meeting spaces, that kind of thing. And also to remove any extra chairs out of there. So there's only max 10 chairs available in the space. Moving chair, that's a big one. Uh, last time, uh, I think uh, Rob from UWCRC said, the common spaces they have uh it's a new building so it's easier for them uh they were keeping the common spaces a little bit cooler than usual so they were trying that anyone anyone else uh doing anything creative or standard that is helping
So I think it was Josh who mentions um, using tape, taping areas. Is that in terms of showing flow of traffic or just taping off like where people can stand so that they're social distancing? What are you doing about the tape? Sorry about that. I thought I was still <laughs> unmuted there. <laughs> um, we we haven't put like a traffic flow, but more of just the way our space is set up, kind of like a, only one person in this block at a time by the mailboxes. And then also outside of uh, staff offices. Um, that way, if anyone's knocking, they have to be behind the line. So it's tape on the like on the floor showing the space. Yes, yeah, it's taped right onto the carpet. I was in a uh, Murdoch building um, a few feels like ages ago. I think a month ago, and they had the sort of the yellow tape um, just blocking off their common areas as well. So the not the police tape, but the yellow um, plastic tape. Um, because their common areas don't have doors. They, it was a pretty, it's like a hallway and then common areas on the side that seem to be keeping people out from them. Anyone else? Joanne, are you, uh, what are you doing about common areas? Yeah, we've done a lot of uh, what's already been met, uh, mentioned and I affirm what Rob said that um, it's, it's been uh, well received when common areas are um, not locked up, not locked. And because it's uh, from those areas instead. And we've also uh, taped, um, shown the distance on, on the walls, how far they need to be apart. Just for those tenants, we serve seniors that need a little bit of a reminder who have some cognition issues, just how far they need to be. So that is taped off with, with pretty ribbon <laughs> to, to show the tenants. That's great. Pretty ribbon is much nicer than uh, that yellow police tape. <laughs> right. But it's uh, it's hard to know who knows what six feet is by eyeballing it. So that's a great, that's right. that's a great idea. Cheryl, what about uh, at Sam, what are you guys Cheryl earlier. I don't know if you're able to unmute yourself and share what you're doing. Well, let's move on to the next question. Uh, I think Cheryl probably has some buildings with elevators too. Um, the What are facilities doing to deal with occupancy in elevators? I know quite a few people have signs and are uh, suggesting one to five people, depending on the size of the elevator. Um, Rob, what are you guys doing at uh, at Westman Lions? We haven't done anything in terms of the elevators yet. That's why I'm asking the question. It's um, you know our our elevators are rather small. You know we we officially only fit one person in each elevator if you were to keep six feet apart. Um, so that's not really realistic, but, you know, do you just allow two per elevator or do you actually, are other facilities actually only limiting it to single occupancy? What's anyone else doing? Cheryl, I saw that you type and meet yourself, remote servers, those things, uh, uh, happen. Uh, I don't know if you can type in the box if you, if there's anything that you're doing about elevators or if anyone else who has an elevator, are you doing anything about um, limiting the number of people? Okay, yeah, so only one in an elevator at a time, time, I guess. 
So we have, we, it's Joanne speaking here. Uh, we have signage up in the elevators and we also encourage people if there's more than two people that they turn and face the wall. So encouraging people not to be coughing at each other or breathing on each other. I was speaking with Blair from the co-op house uh yesterday and he lives in a life lease building and he said that they're um in their building they're limiting occupancy as well so um uh, i think it's limited to two i see eden is limiting it to two uh bonnie says wow it's an ride and people have been very cooperative uh christine uh says that there's lots of signage in and around the elevator paul from bethania uh, signs limiting to two per elevator. So it sounds like limits uh, on the elevators are pretty, that uh, a lot of people are doing that. Heidi, we have a sign on each floor, one person per time, unless it's a couple living together and tenants are following it well. everyone if you have any other uh, things that you're doing feel free to write that in the comment box uh, Rob you also had a question about a uh, thermal temperature reading if anyone has those pointed at the entranceway and if so um, how are they monitored and are they economical I did see a I saw the long-term care association of Manitoba has a source for um, uh, for a thermal temperature reading if people are looking for a place to get them i don't think it's a it's an entryway one though i think it's a handheld one um but is anyone doing it uh varying articles about temperature monitoring and how effective it is so um i'm not going to comment on the effectiveness i'm just going to let people say uh whether or not they're doing it uh is does anyone have any type of thermal temperature reading Rob, do you want to talk about that um yeah like we don't we don't have it here at the moment uh it's just we had considered putting something like that in place with a security guard and a hand, handheld one obviously that would be a greater expense um, but if we're looking at something long term i don't know if this is going to become the new norm and we're going to be kind of uh monitoring guests coming into the facilities uh for long term Obviously, it would make a lot of sense to try and automate that as much as possible. So if there was a, uh, an opportunity to do that, um, I actually lived over in Beijing, China during SARS, and it became quite common quite quick. So uh, I know the technology is there. <clears throat> I just don't know if any of the other facilities have considered it or has something in place or has anybody's looked into it. I haven't looked into the costs yet myself either. I, um since you have a there there's also a personal care home i think uh, uh health more active or required to do more around this um is, is anyone doing anything about monitoring temperatures yeah christine we have uh, in our arlington house because it has supportive housing uh we are required to screen um staff coming in so we have uh, a thermal thermometer um, and it works really good we initially we had to use because we didn't have that we had to use the the regular thermometer with the you had to take off the inserts every time to put them in the ear that's a real headache um, you have to be careful even with the the infrared ones you have to be one to five centimeters so you have to be really close so our people are wearing you know PPE but that's that's again it's healthcare stuff they work, they work good. What what you, what I do find is if, if people have come from outside and have walked, um, been outside for a while when it was pretty cold, it'll register far too far too low. You actually have to wait for them to be acclimatized to be in the in the in the inside for, for a bit. Or what uh, what our staff were finding is if they had a jacket on, just pull up their sleeves and check it on their wrist, and then it was a mu much more uh, realistic temperature reading, but they work, they work and they were very easy to use. So, so, uh, so that's for a 
thermal one, but not necessarily one sort of pointed at the entryway, right? That's a handheld no, one. No, we did have when we were using the inserts, we did actually have because we it, it ours was finicky and it wasn't working all that well. Our, our caretaker had a had one of those ones that they use for checking electronics and 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 you know heat loss and windows and things like that. And he and we used that at when we could get it working, and he would check it, and it actually. It was always about three degrees too low, but but it was very consistent. So we, we said, well, if we really have trouble with the thermometer, we know it's not bad. You just have to add three degrees to it. But I definitely wouldn't use that as a scientific reading of it. The ones that you're talking about with the scanners, and those will be much more expensive, I'm sure, and much more accurate. So it seems like we may want to wait and see around uh, sort of the thermal readings at uh, at entrance ways if uh, if that becomes a thing if that uh, becomes important let us know and we can sort of look for some sort of shared pricing model if we can order um my our uh our colleague here at mamfa c has a uh, a lot of supply contacts in china so if it's common in beijing i think she'll she'll know how to find it uh it may not translation depending on where we find it but we can uh we can look into those sorts of things um but see what uh what public health uh recommends uh going forward um so the next question is about uh ppe um so what is proper ppe for staff that is managed by and i think this is the interlake uh eastern uh regional health authority is the acronym in your building. So this might be different for different health authorities, um, but any, what are staff who are um, healthcare workers, uh, what's uh, sort of PPE protocol for them? And Paul, since I can see you still, if you, is, what are, do you know um, what your healthcare workers are required? Well, there's a lengthy, document i think you might have even had it on your website right or um that 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 sort of list because that was that was changing by the day for some uh often with it the, it it really depends on what what kind of work the person the person's doing so if if it's if it's somebody literally uh doing care they would have the full ppe with with gown uh, visor mask um and because of the concern with the, the quantity of, of usage, uh, it, they would sort of say you weren't needing to replace the, the, the mask or the visor unless there had been, um, it was visibly soiled. Um, or if you had gone from somebody that was not COVID to somebody that was COVID, uh, what they were also suggesting is if you were dealing with population that, that was a segregated COVID population, in other words, in case there had to be a number of them, You'd even use the same PPE because you're going from COVID to COVID, uh, so it was more for protection for the staff. I mean, those were the extreme cases for for most staff. Um, you know, let's say housekeeping or even janitorial. We we provide masks to our to our even in our homes. Uh, it's optional for them to use it, but for for staff in in an actual care setting, like I myself, I'm in administration. I'm not I'm not using any of it. I'm so rarely on the floor. If I'd be actually making contact, having a meeting with with a, a resident, then I'd put on a mask at least, anyways. So, and that's like a disposable yeah. surgical mask. Yeah. Um, Claire, are you on the call? Um, I don't know if I saw you introduce yourself, but do you have? Uh, do you want to comment on or on questions or what they're doing uh, in the interlake? Claire, unless she's a call in, one of the call in users. Um, is there anything? Uh, so, one of the things that uh, may have happened is that we had, when we did a survey of what people's uh, concerns are um, or questions that they have, there um, a number of folks said. 
supplies and PPE was an issue. So C may have called you or emailed you to ask um, some more details about that. Um, so, uh, so we had a list of what people were looking for and what uh, what people are doing. Um, and um, it, it seems that people are generally able to find uh, the disposable masks and disinfectants. Um, lots of people have tenants who are making masks. Um, so people are generally figuring out uh, how to get supplies. Uh, we have a list of places that do um, have supplies. Uh, we don't know, they're not always in stock. Um, and in particular, the like the N95 masks are being prioritized for healthcare. So that will be uh, different. But if you are um, looking for supplies, let us know. And we have a list of places where you might be able to get it. Um, I see Sharon made a comment about home care staff and uh, questions about what they're doing. Uh, Sharon, are you able to, uh, can you speak and, oh, problems with the speaker. Um, if there so questions about what home care staff should be wearing, is that your? I know the home care staff coming in here at the Lions Manor and Brandon are some wear masks, some don't. It doesn't seem to be a consistent directive from our healthcare providers anyway. There doesn't seem to be consistent. We do have, we had on the website, Paul's right, we had the shared health standards. Um, I think the link, it was linked to the government website and I checked it the other day, I think the link was changed because I think they may have updated those standards. So I'll find the standards and send it out to folks. Um, and they're quite detailed about uh, going into homes and what people should be wearing. So if people aren't following those standards, you may want to reach out to your uh, your health authority to find out. Um, I see uh, West, it uh, looks like home care staff do not have any PPE. So, uh, or they're, Bonnie says they're only wearing PPE with tenants in self-isolation. So some of the standards I think are unfortunately based um, on access to PPE more than they are on, um, on necessarily protecting the staff and the tenant, um, but also needing to prioritize, because of those limitations, needing to prioritize them for, um, for the highest need use. Um, we'll keep uh, updating you on that as we find out more information. Um, I see. Paul said that home care staff coming into supportive housing do have masks and visors. So that's here in Winnipeg um, and Monique. Go ahead. The ones here at the chalet, so they, uh, uh, from what I know, they're saying that if they do have the supplies, they do wear masks and stuff. But if they don't have the supplies, they don't. So it's depending whether they have the supplies that came in or not. Okay, thanks, Martha. So that's uh, based on supplies, not necessarily on uh, on what people have. I see Heidi has a comment that they're having a hard time finding masks. Um, so we'll uh, Heidi, we'll send you the list of all the vendors that uh, that we got. Um, and we'll put it on our website as well. We're not uh, calling. We're not going to call them all the time to make sure they have them in stock, but uh, they are organizations that we know have masks and sell them. So. Um, so we'll send that out to folks so you can call around and hopefully be able to access them. But again, the, the, some visors in particular and, uh, the N95 masks, I think are more limited in and set in, uh, healthcare settings. Are there any other comments or questions on protecting our staff and tenants that anyone has that we should talk about? Any comments on PPE? supplies. Uh, Joanne here, just on home care staff uh, coming into the building. Um, on Tuesday, I was advised that home care workers working within the personal care homes um, 
can only work in the one facility now. That does not apply to those working within the community. Our home care workers are going from different facilities. Yes, home care is, as usual, I think still moving um, around different facilities. I was uh, going to mention that for Sam, it's very, very challenging right now because um, we manage nonprofit housing. So as a landlord or property manager, our responsibility is really sharing information with the residents um, and trying to kind of mediate our, um, um, our liability. So we actually reached out to a lawyer who provided us with a legal opinion which we shared with the uh, uh, various boards of directors about locking common areas and access to common areas for residents. And ultimately, most of them decided they were doing a good enough job themselves and uh, would um, prefer to keep, especially in the seniors buildings, um, keep those open for seniors with proper social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, because it's so important for seniors not to feel isolated and lonely. Um, so I think for us, we've kind of taken the position that um, our responsibility is, is to get the information, to provide it to the boards, but ultimately it's the board's res responsibility. But we did have a situation in one of our buildings on Easter weekend when um, a tenant decided to invite some family and guests in the common area. And another tenant got very upset. The family member then contacted the police. The police showed up and um, we haven't heard yet if there's going to be a fine or anything. Um, but Sam was actually slammed all over social media because, uh, you know, hashtagged. Sam doesn't care about seniors kind of thing. So, yeah, so we have to be like so cautious and I, I don't like I, I spent most of last week. What we did was we developed a policy for common room lockage and including gazebos, barbecue areas, all that kind of thing where people would tend to congregate. And we basically put it to our boards and we said, you know, if if you're not choosing to do this, then um, you know, we need a motion from you and we're walking away from it. So the problem with that kind of thinking, though, is, is of course, that there is an issue with um, uh, the public view, as we've already experienced. Thanks, Cheryl. That sounds like a quite the challenging situation. Thanks so much for sharing it. So it's uh, there's the there's the risk uh the sort of the legal risk but then there's the public uh perception risk um and where your resp your responsibility is really a gray area in this because it is independent living and people can make choices and um yeah it's a it's a tough tough situation i saw someone was asking about masks been uh, answered. There's also, uh, so uh, next week we do have a call with um, someone from uh, the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority who will talk a bit more about PPE for us. Um, Michelle asked a question about uh, maintenance and repair, so guidelines for sending contractors into a home. And in some ways this is uh, similar that it's uh, to sort of Cheryl's comment that uh, if it's contractors, the contracting company has the responsibility to protect their staff, um, but yet uh, it's also, uh, as an organization, folks will be um, in uh, in your tenants' homes, and and people will be asking questions about what you're doing. Um, I I know that um, Westbourne. Uh, has a construction project happening right now um, and their contracting company I think has been quite good about um, uh, making sure uh, they're keeping people safe uh, and distant but I'll so I'll, I'll put you in touch with uh, Michelle I'll make an email I'm making a note to myself I'll con make an email connection between you and uh, Mike at West Boyne I see Paul says we screen our contractors the same way we would expect tenants and staff to self screen. So asking Paul, do you want to, could you talk a bit about 
that how you screen contractors? Yeah, they, we will literally, if, if we're arranging them, we will advise the company right up front that, the, you know, obviously the, we, the same questions that, that we, we ask our own visitors, well, now that visitors are restricted, but for, for anybody coming in, if they've traveled outside of Manitoba, if they're, you know, have any of the symptoms, um, you know, and, and if they've, you know, live with anybody that's, ha you know, had been diagnosed or has those symptoms now, at all any of those mild symptoms all of those things are the same questions we would ask and so we'll let them know up front and then when they come into the building uh we'll you know they'll, they'll be expected to ask answer those questions as well the, the specific contractor that comes in great thanks paul um so we'll uh and if anyone else is doing anything else about uh contractors um go ahead and write that in the chat box uh i'm going to move on to our next uh discussion topic which is about finances um there were quite a few questions about this uh rent non-payment so terry uh watton i can see that he's uh joined us on the call um, he was asking how operations are being affected by tenants be unable to pay rent, providing notice to vacate, um, unable to increase rents. So uh, essentially, how have you changed your projections for revenues or operating resources? Um, can anyone speak to that? It's Rob here. Uh, go ahead. Rob from Lions Manor. Um, so we haven't had any problems with tenants not being able to pay rent. Uh, we have two commercial tenants, though. One is our, our uh, beauty salon tenant, and the other one is the Canadian Cancer Society. Their offices in Brandon are here at our facility. Uh, Cancer Society, they're um, in really poor shape because all of their fundraisers have been cancelled for the year. Um, so they've asked for three months rent abatement. And we've given, uh, uh, we, we've allowed our, our hair salon tenant not to pay rent as well. So we're down revenues for those two things. I know the government's coming up with a commercial rent uh, support program, just waiting to find out more information on that, where they're gonna be federal program, where they're gonna cover 50% of the cost of rents as long as the tenant agrees to pay 25% and the landlord agrees to waive the, the remaining 25%. So just waiting to find out more information on that. Um, and then in terms of costs, cost increases, uh, we've probably gone up by a third, our cleaning costs for our common areas for continual disinfectant of, disinfecting of the railings, doors, elevators, et cetera. So we have a significant increased expense for that. Plus we've decided to um, pay our, our maintenance staff uh, a bit of a bonus, almost like hazard pay through this period um, because they're continuing, continuing to do um, essential maintenance. Thanks Rob. I saw that uh, the BC Nonprofit Housing Association is doing a survey of their uh, members asking specifically that question, increased costs and reduced revenues, um, so that we can try to track that as a sector. So we may do a similar survey with you so that we can sort of can say um, the extent of that change um, to advocate to government. We have written a letter to the Minister of Families as well as Finance um suggesting that there should be in particular for buildings with fixed rate subsidies or those without uh subsidies that there should be some sort of um uh support for nonprofit housing providers i'll i'll put that letter on our website i don't think I've, it will be in our newsletter this uh coming week as well um is anyone else um seeing changes in projections for revenues and uh, costs? Christine, I know uh, I would expect uh, for this year just ended, it, really no impact, but we've got a significant number of vacancies right now and because we're not, we're not Filling the, you know, not doing new showings right now. Still, uh, I do see that we'll have a higher vacancy rate overall, so it will affect our revenues for the twenty, you know, twenty-one fiscal year. So 
so the so the vacancies will be a, an issue as well as um I don't know, I guess for seniors buildings, um, unpaid rent might be less of an issue than for family buildings. I was speaking with uh, Blair from CHF and he said that their members um, had across Canada um, had about a 10, less than a 10% reduction so far, um, but they expect that this month might be different. Um, so it might depend. Some uh, co-ops and I think probably nonprofits uh, have uh, that tendency to, I think some co-op boards were saying, well, just, okay, let's just waive the rent this month because they want to be nice. Um, and I know CHF uh, is strongly encouraging people not to do that um, because there are some programs available for um, people to access through the federal government. Um, some people haven't seen any changes uh, in their income. So to be quite careful about um, just sort of doing any blanket uh, rent holidays because um, we don't want nonprofits uh, and co-ops to be in a financial predicament um, because of this. Anyone else have comments on this? I'm actually surprised how little the impact has been at the moment. Um, but, you know, like, as you said, most seniors buildings, uh, it's not an issue. It is more of an issue in the lower income seniors buildings, though, because many, uh, many people, you know, they pay their rent direct. They're used to coming down to our office and paying debit. We do huge amounts of debit payments every every month and you know it was kind of a struggle to get them trained in that instead of paying cash so now um you know we're being very very proactive we're reaching out to all tenants who haven't paid their rent uh by now and kind of saying what's your situation how can you help um, one of our buildings in particular though is struggling with very very high arrears and it's really a, i believe a financial literacy problem um, that they don't know how to go get a check or a money order, or put something in the mail or get a stamp or, uh, it's just a, it, it's just a different way of thinking. So actually today, um, two of our property managers went out to that building with a portable debit machine and they're taking appropriate precautions because the arrears are just staggering, but it's, it's only really been that, that one building. Everybody's been kind of proactive and our property managers are doing a really good job following up with people and saying, hey, what's your situation? Okay, well, let's get a payment arrangement. So, you know, this doesn't impact you too much a couple months down the road kind of thing. So, but vacancies, I agree a hundred percent. It's it's a new way of doing things. Thanks, Cheryl. So really proactive communication uh, with tenants or um, make it on a building by building basis, figuring out how to make sure people have the ability to pay rent if um, if the, it's a significant change for folks. I was speaking with uh, Lawrence uh, from Kinu Housing a while ago, and he said um, that this has been a great push to get tenants to start to use uh, direct payments. In the past, they had folks who um, who would get robbed uh, on their way to pay their rent. And now that's not happening. So um, there are some shifts that um, aren't necessarily negative. I saw Michelle asked about the minimum uh, $50 rent charge. This would be for someone who's receiving a Manitoba housing um, subsidy. Um, I think I think you're, it's a sponsor managed building. Is that I? I think that's what you have, Michelle. Yes, um, Ryan. Uh, so R R Paul has confirmed, and I think Ryan Kareen from Manitoba Housing is on the call as well, so he could also confirm that. But um, I know within the direct managed buildings, they said that the fifty dollars minimum rent charge um, has been what they've been doing, and Ryan confirms that for sponsor managed, that is correct. Okay, so keep sharing that information about um, how you're being affected by this. Um, it's really helpful for us to gather that information. Oh, James raised a hand. I didn't know we had that capacity. That's great. James, can you share uh, what's changed for you in terms of uh, uh, revenue projections and operating costs? I can't hear you, James.
stream? Can you? I see you're not muted on the screen. But it might be on your phone or your computer. Oh, speaker is not working. Damn. That technology. Okay. Well, if we if we figure it out, or if you want to type into the box, I know it takes a while. Uh, and we can move on to the next question uh, while we go. So uh, Paul has said that they're not uh, showing uh, suites um, uh, to new applicants. Is that correct? Is everyone still holding off on new move-ins? Or is anyone uh, showing suites yet? We're still showing suites, but only vacant ones. So that puts a little bit of a time crunch because usually we start showing suites as soon as a, you, somebody gives notice. Um, but we are showing suites using appropriate social distancing. We're still signing leases electronically, all that kind of thing. So um, in some cases, yes, we are still filling vacancies and there is a huge demand for housing right now. Uh, we get so many inquiries every day. Um, from people who are desperate for housing. So um, we hope to be able to help people in that way, but you know, it, it doesn't work in all units or buildings. Thanks, Cheryl. I see a few other comments here that Bonnie says that they're showing vacant suites and screening people only doing it one at a time. Um, and Andre uh, says vacant suites will show after they're renovated. So it'll increase the rent loss, right? There's so there's a longer time that suites are vacant, but people are um, filling them. Anyone else has any comments on what you're doing about uh, vacancies? And Martha, you also asked about uh, advertising vacant units. Um, Martha, how do you advertise vacant units? Well, that was a question I was asking because right now, due to like us not really be able to bring people in, is there something that people are doing online and or something like that to get the word out there that there are suites available? Great question. Is anyone doing anything to get the word out about vacant units? Michelle asks about virtual showings, so that could be a resource. Uh, Andre says they have a large waiting list, so don't need to advertise. We use something called forrent.com, and it's actually, uh, we've got a lot of different um, uh, inquiries from that. Uh, the other thing is if you're in seniors housing, it, I guess it probably won't happen this year, but um, is the seniors expo. We go and we take applications, we help people fill them out. Um, it's a really great opportunity to showcase the different kinds of housing we have because we manage so many different types of buildings. Where's the seniors expo organized by? Um, Manitoba Society of Seniors, I believe. It happens in, I believe it's in May of every year. Um, we've done it the past two years and um, we generally set up two different booths like at uh, each end because we get so many people visiting. Um, so we purchase a table um, at one end of the, uh, the expo and then at the other end of the expo. And um, our staff is available to help fill pe help people fill out applications right there. It's a really, really good opportunity. I, I can get you the information and send it to you. I, I don't look after that anymore, but um, I can send you the information after. Great, thanks, Cheryl. And we can share that with everyone. Um, and I can check. I'll check in with them to see if they're planning anything. Um, obviously, not for May, but uh, maybe uh, later on in the year. I know the within Winnipeg, the Winnipeg Rental Network also has um, an online uh, list, but it's not it's not super well. It's it's used 
a bit. Um, for seniors building the other, it, when I get calls from people thinking that we're Manitoba housing, which happens, um, often I refer uh, in particular seniors to age and opportunity. So it might be worth reaching out to, uh, to age and opportunity to let you know, let them know, because um, they likely get calls because they have their, um, their housing uh, guide as well. Any other comments, questions? Oh, I see Terry write, writes that the expo has been postponed to 2021. Okay, thanks, Terry. Anything else on finances that people have questions about? What about the cancellation of the rent increases? Is there any, is there any word on when that's going to be lifted um how much notice we're going to be given great question uh there's no word yet we do have a um a meeting or a phone call coming up with michelle um from rtb so she's the acting director on may 13th so we can ask her some of those questions um i know in particular people are concerned about um how much information they'll get, how quick they'll adjust the the, the rate uh, of increase based on this um, gap of time. Um, it's my sense from speaking with RTB that they were um, they received about as much notice as uh, we did about the rent freeze, so a uh, rent increase freeze. So they're um, hopefully they'll get more information as that changes in a, so that they can prepare, but, um, I don't know that they have any certainty that that will happen. Any other questions, comments on finances? We will talk about sort of changes going forward. So I think there is a question coming up about, um, advocacy of the, uh, rent increase. Future operations, uh, plans to return to normalcy or using social distancing. So Rob, uh, you'd asked, how are others dealing with requests to bring back events that can be done with physical distancing um, or groups of less than 10 participants? Um, and Claire asked, what are the easement strategies going forward? So that's somewhat similar. Rob, what are, what are you doing when people request to uh, gather together? Uh, well, we've just been trying to dis or to yeah not encourage it as much as possible uh, up until this stage. But with things reopening slowly, there's going to be more pressure to allow individuals to congregate. Um, we're trying to figure out a strategy for our morning coffee time. Generally, there's 30 to 40 individuals that congregate in our coffee lounge every morning. Are we going to try and change that so that everybody has a certain hour, you know, where we, we max up out at 10 people per hour and they stagger it that way? Or are we going to split it up into different rooms? I don't know yet what our, what our strategy is going to be, but we're going to have to do something um, in addition to just, you know, limiting the amount of chairs and tables available in each, in each meeting space or common space. Um, the bigger events, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see in terms of catered meals, bingo events, card nights, games nights, happy hours, those kind of things. I just kind of guess we just keep off the calendar for the next few months until until we figure out, you know, where things are going with this phased approach back to normal. Uh, once we get to a point where we can allow congregations of, of 40 to 50 people per event, then, you know, I guess we'll we'll have to deal with that a little bit differently because um, yeah, it, it all depends. Like, the, the other element to this is, as we found out yesterday, we now have to provide 10 square meters per person, uh, or at least uh, retail businesses do. So if that kind of same 10 square meterage applies for our common spaces, we'll have to do pull up to take measures and do a lot of figuring and figure out what our new occupancy is per room going forward. So they have 10 square meters or up to 10 uh, in common areas. Typically I've seen sort of 10 in common areas, but then patios, for example, are 50% occupancy rates. So it's sort of, it, it's detailed, but also depends on what sort of space it is. 
Um, does anyone else, uh, has anyone else started sort of thinking about what you're going to do about requests for events and uh, limiting sizes of groups? We're just, uh, just starting to think about it now as well. We looked at the, 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 the lengthy document from, from that the government put out uh, with the changes that are starting and we're, we're talking about likely initially putting half the furniture back into our common spaces so it's spread out and, and, and doing that. Uh, and, and similar to what Rob was talking about, we'll probably start looking at the coffee times allowing that and you know just always reminding people with spacing and whatnot. But I think the, the events, uh, the, like the bingos and the ones that are set events with groups, we, we don't expect we'll, we'll be starting those up till fall at the earliest. Paul, anyone else? I'm curious to, sorry, Christine, I'm curious to know what others are doing as far as um, tenant services uh, coming, restoring those back in their facilities, particularly hairdressing. services like hairdressing that's a good uh good question because i think hairdressing are they're the first phase that hairdressing yes. Is now? yes yeah we just uh just talked about that especially in, in arlington with their supportive housing and and i think given what what the new guidelines are i think we will be likely introducing that in this coming week already, uh, I think, you know, obviously everyone needs to know the, the, the spacing and whatnot that that'll still be required. But I think that seems like something we, we should be allowing back in. Heidi says that there are opening on Monday with the new guidelines. And she also says that are also canceled at least until the end of May. Um, any events that include people coming from outside the building uh, are cancelled until the end of June. Let's see, Andre says we're uh, allowing the hairdressers to operate on Monday with new protocols for protection and making sure it's not a gathering place. So haircuts for a haircut, <laughs> not for the, the social time that haircuts often are also connected to. Are these all seniors facilities that are bringing the hairdressing back? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any other uh, sort of easement strategies going forward that, that people have been thinking about or plan for? Rob, you also asked about extra cleaning, if extra cleaning will be the new norm. Um, and you mentioned how much uh, the sort of costs attached to extra cleaning. Does anyone else have plans for cleaning or thoughts about how that might change? It really makes you think about, you know, what what kind of standards we're going to have in place going forward. Like, our tenants use the common areas independently of anything our 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 staff or the management here organize. So, um, you know, our thinking is that we're going to just have to have posters up and and provide disinfectant sprays and so on in all of the areas, like our games room um, or our sewing room or our workshop where. We have an expectation that the tenants wipe down everything after use. Um, and that's, I think, just going to have to be uh, built into a new expectation going forward. The elevators and doors and everything, like I said, we're, we've been doing them three times a day now. Um, uh, at, you know, at a minimum, plus, you know, if there's heavy traffic, then we'll, we'll give it an extra wipe. But um yeah i guess you know probably that's going to become the new norm and we're just going to have to build that into our budgets going forward that's what i'm thinking 
Thanks, Rob. Mm -hmm. um, are people having trouble with theft when they're when they're leaving those sprays and and wipes in those areas? Um, we've had increased theft. Yeah, for sure. Given the shortage of supply, um, hand sanitizer is the worst. <laughs> Yeah. Um, hopefully that comes back to an, a, a normal and, and a good supply at some point here. Andre says that they've uh, lost gloves from their maintenance cart. So hopefully, yeah, hopefully once uh, once everyone has all the hand sanitizer they can use, it will become yeah. of an issue. There are ways to sort of lock things down, but that makes it feel a lot less like like a welcoming space. Dave says, looking to disinfect once a day. Once restrictions subside, we'll look to have a high touch surface area list of areas to be disinfected by cleaning staff. Um, I see Westman Housing will be maintaining new standards of disinfectant going forward. I think James might have his speaker working now. James, what are you doing at Winnipeg Housing? Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Hi, James. Hi, hi everyone. Um, yeah, cleaning standards uh, and theft, all those types of things, we're dealing with all of it. Uh, additional cleaning uh, processes that we've put in place for all of our sites. Um, what we're trying to do with our staff is to have minimal amounts of supplies on the cart because, uh, yeah, that, that's especially in the uh, social housing aspect. Uh, people are looking for additional items if they can, uh, not only not only for their own use but to actually sell. Uh, we've had that through some of our buildings where they've been trying to take supplies and then uh, we see uh, somebody within the building an hour or two later trying to sell the same supplies that they just stole from us. So uh, lots of challenges that we have. Thanks, James. I, uh, my, my husband, yeah, and he says in Columbia, there's become, there's this, people are going through the recycling carts and taking the masks and reselling them. Um, and so I think it's a, uh, lack of income leads to bad choices that put people at risk so we'll uh be careful about what uh what is out and i know it's in folks um i thought i saw one more comment um but the so rob also has a question about good reference materials that have been published to help figure out the new norm uh, i see a couple of people refer to some uh, maintenance standards that they have for their cleaning staff i don't know if anyone has some good reference materials that you've been using that you might be able to share or uh, resources i haven't seen public health um health canada has information about disinfectants um, and you can look up disinfectants and how to use them, that sort of thing. And they do have some information on uh, cleaning uh, public spaces. So they have some recommendations there. Um, but if anyone else has any other good reference material that you would recommend. Sorry, was that a question for me? Yeah, Rob, do you have good reference materials to help figure out the new norm? Uh, well, there was there was one that came through. I can't remember where it came through from. It was a Manitoba resource, a housing resource reference material. But no, nothing, nothing specifically for housing that I thought. And that's why I'm asking the question if there was something out there that's that's going to help us understand what the new norms are going to be or or tips or ideas for, you know, um, having our facilities as as uh, compliant as possible going forward. I can ask, uh, I saw that the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association has a forum uh, that they got started up as well. So I could reach out there. Um, it's sort of like our forum uh, that people prefer than the online forum, but I can try uh, to check with uh, other housing across the country to see if anyone has some reference material. That'd be much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Ryan, I don't know if I know Manitoba housing, you're, uh, you tend to have more stuff written down, um, obviously, but you also are bigger and have different requirements around standards. Any uh, 
um, materials on sort of cleaning standards that might be applicable to the nonprofit sector that could be shared? I think Ryan doesn't have sound, so he might be typing. So I'll, oh, it's, yeah, audio not working, typing in the chat and listening on the phone. So if there is uh, on uh, sort of cleaning standards, uh, specifically in housing, it would be helpful to share. And uh, so we'll look for resources and try to share them with folks. Great questions. Uh, oh, and Ryan says that they have something coming out today. Great. Thanks, Ryan. Anything else on uh, making plans to return to normal that, uh, that people have? There's one more question about, uh, so Krista uh, asked this about uh, annual meeting planning. Um, so uh, requirements um, of doing uh, annual meetings, so depending on, I think Krista is a life lease. Um, most of uh, you are nonprofit corporations. So depending on the legislation, typically you need to have a, an annual meeting within 15 months of your last one. Um, I know the, the registrar for the Co-op Act has specifically stated that they um, they won't uh, hold people to that standard, and people can postpone. And there's some information about um, about that. Um, I've reached out to uh, the um, Corporations Act uh, Registrar to see uh, if they have anything specific on this, but I haven't heard yet. Um, Oh, I see uh, Terry shared some information that BC Housing has some protocols um, for schools and childcare programs that's online. Great. Thanks, Terry. I'll, uh, uh, if you want to send me the link, I can share that with folks. Uh, has anyone been thinking about annual meetings? Um, or I know they tend to be in June. Cheryl, I yeah. wanted to ask what Sam's boards are doing. Okay, so we have both co-ops and life leases. Um, so we reached out to the registrar's office for cooperatives <clears throat> and they actually prefer, prepared uh, a QA and a on um, uh, annual meetings or meetings of members in general um, and basically have said it's in the board's discretion, but they're not going to be penalizing or saying you're going against uh, the act if you don't meet. Um, so we have basically presented that to all our boards who are in agreement that they don't want to meet. Um, some have decided that they do want to send out the information package in advance and then just advise people. Um, so technically what the registrar's office has said is um, that we have to advise them um, that we're not going to be holding it on in the usual time, but, you know, we'll keep them posted. Um, and for life leases, we actually reached out to the residential tenancies branch to see what their interpretation of the act was. Um, and Michelle got back to us right away and she said that in their opinion, the act uh, hadn't been amended in any way to take away that requirement. Um, but that we could certainly issue um, information packages and provide the information um, to our tenants. So that's what we're doing. We're doing the required schedules and providing um, kind of an analysis of the audit along with a questionnaire to tenants so that they can get back to us um, on any questions they have on it. So basically what we're doing with, with a lot of the co-ops and life leases is providing the information without having a meeting and having a meeting when we can. Great, that's very helpful. I do have the co-op housing information on their website with the link um, to the registrar's uh, guidelines, uh, and they also have a um, an opinion from TDS Law about uh, their annual meetings because I think um, they basically said that uh, a virtual meeting may not be good enough because you need to have good opportunity for people to ask questions and to vote. So there are certain standards that will need to be in place. Um, 
So yeah, so for life leases, similarly sharing information, uh, let them know that they'll have a meeting when they can. What about uh, nonprofits generally, Cheryl? Do you have any information on those? Uh, yeah, the timing of our others hasn't really been as um, critical right now. They, they tend to end different times. So I don't really have any information on other nonprofit requirements. Anyone else been thinking about their AGM or have plans for their AGM? I know we've been thinking about uh, ours uh, tends to be in June um, and we will likely hold a virtual one and you'll get some information about that. So we'll be doing some research on the standards that we can uh, share with folks as well. I was part of the a national one that had a Zoom call for an AGM and it went quite smoothly. Krista, I don't know if you're here, if you have, uh, I don't see you unless you're one of the anonymous call-in people. Um, but if anyone else has questions or comments on annual meetings, this um, has been a bit of a back burner issue, but more people will be thinking about it now. I will let people know as, as we come back to that. Um, so sector needs and advocacy. So Bonnie asked um, about collectively advocating on how to deal with the rental rate freezes. Um, Bonnie, are you here? Yeah, I see you there. Um, I don't know if you are able to uh, speak to share um, your suggestions on dealing with the rental rate freeze. Hi. Are there thoughts specifically on what we should be advocating for on the freeze? Uh, so there was one comment um, about uh, having information <laughs> as soon as possible about when that might change so people are prepared. Um, we can also ask uh, if, so we do have a call coming up with Michelle. So if there are specific um, suggestions on this, I think it's a good time to come up with them together. So then we can share those with Michelle. I'm curious if we'll be advocating for us as a group. Uh, we certainly will. Um, it would be, yeah, it'd be helpful to ha have information um, as long as you agree to do the survey um, about uh, how much uh, the rent freeze has impacted your uh, revenues and finances for the year. So then we can, um, help to make the case to RTB um, about the impact on the sector. Anyone else have any comments on the rent freeze, concerns, questions, suggestions on sort of specific things we should be advocating for? I'll let you think about it and you can get back to me on it. Uh, I also saw that Don, so Don sent a question. Don is with Manso, the Manitoba Association uh, Newcomer Settlement Organizations, maybe? Sorry, <laughs> I know the acronym. So there he's uh, the Portage of the Prairie. So he says that the homeless shelter and soup kitchen have closed uh, the shelter due to due to the virus, uh, groups working on both issues. Are there any creative ideas, warning strategies that other communities have used to address these kinds of issues in other communities? I don't know 
Winnipeg, the response to homelessness has been relatively organized. And I know so Main Street Project has um, opened up a, uh, they have uh, have some space uh, from a vacant building um, from Manitoba Housing that they're using for isolation. Um, and uh, organizations have resources uh, for hotels, but we're a community that receives federal funding for homelessness. So we're in a privileged position in that way. I don't know if anyone from uh, outside of Winnipeg, uh, Brandon, Brandon also has some access to funding, or Steinbeck or Winkler, anything that your communities are doing to, uh, to deal with the, the need for uh, housing and food for people? There's a team from Eden here. I don't know if there's uh, in Winkler, if you want to share what you're, if you're aware of what the community response has been. So Jackie says that the Steinbeck is still operating on a takeout basis. Anything else? I saw a central, um, John, if you're on the call, I, oh, Monique says we don't have a full running shelter in regular times, only overnight stay in Steinbeck. Question from James. Uh, I'll get to that in a second, James. The other, uh, so Don, if you're on the call, um, I think I'll send you a connection to um, the central station in uh, Winkler, I think has been quite creative. They were, I saw on social media that they were delivering meals door to door um, for folks. They have a lot of volunteer resources, so they um, might be in a unique situation as well but they might be a good group to connect with for ideas. Um, Monique, uh, could you remind me who the contact is for the uh, shelter in Steinbeck? Um, the chat box, I can send that information to Dawn as well. Um, and James has a question that uh, I think people will also need to connect Oh, today house. Thanks, Monique. Uh, so the question about what organizations are doing about reopening their offices. Do they have full staff coverage or still promoting work from home. James, what are you doing um, at Winnipeg Housing about uh, folks in the office? Uh, can you hear me okay? I just want to make sure my system's working. Okay, perfect. Um, so we've been keeping our staffing down in our office down to no more than 10, um, you know, and it, it, it adjusts uh, for the last couple of weeks, we've had our full finance team in because preparing for audit season, those types of things. Uh, but with now with the announcement uh, yesterday of kind of uh, loosening up things, um, we want to start getting more staff back in. We we do have uh, we can bring staff back in safely where they're uh, further than six feet apart. Uh, but we don't want to bring all our staff back immediately. Uh, we want to kind of do it as a staged approach. So just trying to get an indication from what others are doing. Cheryl, what are you guys doing at Sam? Uh, pretty much the exact same thing. Like we've got everybody working from home right now. Um, essentially, that's because our our building that we're housed in though is closed, and so they've asked us to kind of minimize staff because they want to upkeep the building cleanliness and everything. Um, so if a staff person needs to get something from the office, they need to go through one of the management team and then we, we go meet um, our staff so that we can disarm the building and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so we have recently been talking about having people return to work. Uh, we were kind of waiting for the provincial announcement um, yesterday to see what the restrictions look like in terms of, of lessening things, untightening things up. Um, 
but we were kind of uh, thinking about the same kind of thing, like a staged approach. So maybe having, uh, you know, a certain amount of the staff working Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and then um, the other uh, portion working Tuesday, Thursday, and then alternating that on a rotational basis. Um, we do have facilities that in some cases it's possible for people to be six feet apart, but I mean, there's always the common area hallways and stuff like that where it's a little tighter. Um, we are looking at making some structural changes to our office though as well. Uh, we've asked our in-house team to design a kind of plexiglass shield around the reception area, as well as closing off with kind of a gate, um, the front area from the area where the staff is. We frequently have tenants come, you know, wander through looking for somebody and, you know, it's not really the receptionist's job to jump them or anything. So, <laughs> so um, we're definitely going to have to make some changes. Uh, personally, I've had several staff call me and say, when can we get back to work? They're just, which was surprising. I thought everybody would love working from home, but I think people are just <laughs> Be people now and yeah. you know have have a little sense of normalcy so um, we have a management uh, meeting our management team meets uh, via teleconference every morning at 9 30 um, to brainstorm and stuff so uh, I think tomorrow we'll be chatting about what that return to work looks like um, I know particularly our finance team has been very stressed working from home on audits and the Manitoba housing reporting that's needed. Thanks, Cheryl. I see uh, Ryan also said that they're using staged uh, work hours um, and work from home where possible at Manitoba housing. James, I think you had another comment. Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, we've, we've already got everything set up uh, in regards to tenants coming in. Uh, our office is closed right now, but tenants being able to come in to pay for their rent. So we've already put up the plexiglass uh, we're going to have a staging area, so we've already got all the uh, signage up and things like that. So we're hoping to, I, I don't think we'll be prepared next week yet, but probably the week after to open up our office again to the public. We want to make sure that we have clear communication to our tenants uh, and our staff understand, you know, their, their roles and responsibilities, especially around the whole aspect of uh, cleaning that area once a tenant has come in. Uh, we before had a, a reception area where uh, before all of this took place, we probably sometimes had up to eight or 10 tenants in that same area at the same time, probably within, you know, a, a foot of one another, and that's all going to be changing. So I think the biggest thing is, is, you know, uh, staging everybody back, but then also clear communication to your tenants on, you know, what the new normal is going to be at least, at least for the next while. And I think that's, we're going through that, uh, like Sam, uh, we are. Uh, we meet on a daily basis. We meet at 1 30 in the afternoon um, and do our planning through that process. And we, uh, after the announcement yesterday, we, uh, we kind of decided that we want to start bringing uh, finance team is finished with audit now. So they're going to be able to have some days working from home so we can bring some other staff in, but we're going to do the, you know, some property managers, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, some Tuesdays, Thursdays, and ensure that we're going to have this social distancing as far as the office gets uh, is concerned as well. So. Sounds good. Thanks, James. We should get the cart people at Costco to come and train all the staff. They're, uh, they've been pretty amazing at their communication. I've, I've noticed they've really stepped it up. Um, any other comments on offices um, opening and what anyone's doing that you want to share? We've, we've had uh, basically no change, and that's because we're in the PCH, most of our staff. But in the buildings where there are multiple staff, the offices are still, the people have still been coming in. So we haven't had really any change that way. It's not a big staff, so they can generally socially distance. Uh, we did reduce the hours and encouraged all tenants to be contacting by phone or email, but uh, there is still. Uh, personal contact, but we've also laid out, you know, spots to stand if they're waiting so that they're, they're going to keep two meters apart. So those things will likely be in place for some time. Thanks, Paul. Just aware of the time, it's 1026. I think there were some other questions uh, from Martha that maybe we could just people answer in the chat box, because these are sort of general questions. 
um, about a cost of rent for seniors and cost of meals. So these may or may not have changed uh, due to uh, COVID-19, I, I probably not, um, unless there's um, maybe meals have a takeout fee or something like that. But if people could write in that comment box uh, to share that information with Martha, um, and we could also share some information with you um, from what we uh, have heard from members so far. Um, and then uh, there was also a question about how we can make our organization better. And I think we'll have to leave that question for a, a later time. It's 1027. So um, this was a board chair. So we may, um, we haven't had a lot of board members join these calls because they've been pretty operationally focused. But if other folks have sort of board related questions, uh, let us know. Thanks. I saw Andre shared some information um, about their rent and meals. So that's awesome. Please uh, go ahead and share that information if you can. So I'll go to um, the a couple of uh, upcoming things that I wanted to share. And then um, if folks want to stay on a little bit longer, if you have other comments or questions, please do. So some stuff that Mampha is doing uh, that we'd like to share with you. So we do have a web page that has resources. Um, if you have any good resources that you want to share, please uh, send them to me by email or I'll put my uh, email in the box. So you can send them to me by email and we'll make sure that they're up on the website. I haven't um, up in a few days, um, but we'll also have some information on our, um, in our new have a stack of resources I've been waiting to share. So next week, our newsletter will also have some information. Um, the other thing is that we have a forum, an online forum uh, that we set up thinking folks that would want to chat with each other directly. Um, the feedback I've heard is that people don't have time or don't remember to put stuff into the forum, and that's fine. There is a ton of information in there if you want to take a look at it. I think that quite a few people have been viewing it. Um, C has been putting up a lot of resources, in particular resources for tenants. So please do uh, use that anytime. If you have any uh, issues with accessing it, we also have a webinar coming up. So we have a Q and A with Chantel. She's an uh, in infection prevention and control specialist at the WRHA. So that's a question and answer. Uh, when you register, if you have questions about uh, personal protective equipment or about um, infection prevention and control, please uh, put that in and it will be an open Q&A. So she's gonna talk kind of broadly about their recommendations around PPE and disinfecting um, locations. And then we can have an open question and answer. So that's on May 6th, please register that. This information is on our website uh, under the education and events uh, tab. We also have, as I've mentioned, a Q&A with RTB coming up. So uh, Michelle, uh, the acting director from RTV, will join us on May 13th at 9 a.m. If you have any questions for RTV, I think uh, a lot of folks have questions about what, uh, what's happening now, as well as plans going forward. It's a good chance to raise concerns, comments. Um, some questions in particular um, that have been asked are about the resources that they have available to them to deal with a mediation or a mediated agreement. Um, so that they're done in a timely way. So um, that may be something that uh, RTB itself may have a hard time advocating for, but we could advocate on their behalf to make sure that they're um, adequately staffed. Uh, and then we also have a survey. I don't know if I can, oh no, I can't. Uh, I'll find a way to put that. Oh, C, uh, C is coming up as Christina Mays, you know, because we uh, figured out we she's signed in as me. So. That wasn't me, but she put in the survey link. This is a survey to give us feedback on this call and future calls. So uh, your feedback is very much appreciated. So you can help us um, make these better. Um, tell us if you had any technical issues so that we can try to resolve them for um, the future um, or particular topics that you're interested in, how often you want us to have these calls. The survey is, I think it's five or six questions. So it should take no more than five minutes. And it really helps us a lot if you can uh, fill that in. Um, we 
We're at uh, 1031. I don't know if there's any final comments, questions that anyone has before we wrap up. See anyone raising their hand or any comments in the chat box? All right. Well, thanks so much again for participating and for sharing what what you're doing and uh, questions you have. It um, having these discussions, I know, really helps us to know what you're dealing with, and um, and more importantly, helps you to know what each other's doing. Um, we're all uh, learning as we go, and so. Uh, having that information uh, and sharing it with each other will all help us to take care of ourselves and our families and our tenants better. Um, thanks again, please fill in the survey and uh, don't hesitate to call or email us anytime if there's anything you need. We, are, we did record this session, so we'll uh, share the information back to you as well as the comments from the chat box. So that will be sent to everyone who registered today. So thanks again and uh, take care.